To observe quantum Hall effect, we would need two ingredients. You would need to have a two-dimensional uh, electron gas, and you would need to have a magnetic field perpendicular to the plane of this two-dimensional electron gas. So if you look from the top, this is our uh, segment of a, of, a, of, a 2D, of a 2D gas, and the, um, the charge carriers the electrons, if you have electric field applied, they will go um, along this channel in the absence of, um, of the scattering. Um, if you have a magnetic field applied, so this one is at B equals zero. If a magnetic field is non-zero, then in addition to this um, um, straight motion, you will have um, also a cyclotron motion. So the circular motion and a combination of those two would then create this sort of um, uh, cyclotron spirals at, uh, at even higher magnetic field, which depends also on the uh, concentration of carriers in the sample and also on its quality. Uh, at some particular magnetic fields, you will have a situation where um, all the um, all the electrons are localized inside these uh, cyclotron orbits around some impurity centers in the sample. But you will have on the edges um, these skipping orbits, basically, because the cyclotron orbit cannot, cannot continue beyond the edge of the sample. So those are the edges of the sample. This is the top view. Uh, they will have to continue like skipping along the edges. And then if you look, uh, because of the symmetry reasons and because of the way the Lorentz force works you will have a slight difference um, actually quite a profound difference on the two edges so you see on the on the bottom edge you will have um, the right propagating mode um, you have the so these right moving electrons and uh, on the top edge you will have the left moving electrons so you have now very naively speaking, you have a one-dimensional channels. Those uh, two one-dimensional channels. And the behavior along those edges has a chirality, right? So there's a uh, right moving and le left moving particles. Uh, so those edges, they are chiral edges. And it's quite a nice system to study the quantum Hall effect. So you start from a two-dimensional system, then the bulk essentially becomes a zero-dimensional. So all the all the motion stops and only localized around these small um, cyclotron orbits. And you would also have um, a 1D channels. So in this system, you can study both a two-dimension, three-dimension, uh, one-dimensional, and zero-dimensional systems. Um, to go beyond this uh, kind of simplified picture, we should uh, we should treat the problem quantum mechanically. So, in addition to this um, uh, semi-classical description of the cyclotron orbits and the skipping skipping uh, of those orbits on the edges, we can do a better job by considering a quantum mechanics. And and for this, we would need to introduce the concept of Landau levels. So, how do we do this, and what what are those Landau levels? You would need to have um, to add the magnetic field to quantum mechanics, and the conventional way to do it is to use a vector potential. So, the magnetic field, just to remind you. The magnetic field is the is the curl of the vector potential, and in our case, it's uh, magnitude of the field times in the in the z direction because it's a perpendicular to the plane. So then you can write a Hamiltonian in this form. minus E A squared. 
So now we have this interesting term because the magnetic field is, uh, is the curl of the vector potential. So you can choose a vector potential in a multiple ways. And it's kind of, it's the gauge invariance problem. And I think you probably are familiar with this one. So the vector potential, we can introduce instead of this vector potential, some other vector potential, which is defined as the initial vector potential plus some function, um, which is a gradient, basically. So it's a function, which is a gradient of some function. And then you will have this term, uh, if you want to look for what happens when you when you take the curl, you will have this kind of this term, and the curl of the gradient is zero. So any arbitrary function, which is a gradient of a function, can be added, and this is known as the gauge invariance. So this means we can select vector potential multiple in a multiple ways. And there are several uh, ways of doing this. There's, sen uh, there's a symmetric gauge. In this case, we will use um, a Landau gauge. A Landau gauge, which is defined as magnetic field x direction and uh, um, j component of the of the spatial spatial dimension. So in the vector column form, you will have it like that. So we can now write down the Schrodinger equation, which will be 1 over 2m, px squared, and I'm just plugging the vector potential result there. We'll have py minus eb, ebx squared, acting on a wave function psi. That will be our uh, Schrodinger equation. And note that the vector potential doesn't depend on y. So the A doesn't depend on y. And this means we can guess we can guess a wave function in the form of plane wave of y and maybe some unknown function of x. So the wave function, uh, which is a, a function of both spatial coordinates, x and y, is a, some unknown function of x coordinate times the e to the i k y to introduce the plane wave in the y direction. So now let's see what happens if we act by the py on, on the wave function. We get we get the following minus i h bar d d y e i k e i k y. That's the that's the p y operator acting on a wave function. Um, so basically, on the on the plane wave part, it will result in adding the h bar k. So we have the h bar, the k comes out, i a, i k comes out, and minus i i cancels, so you get h bar k. And we can rewrite the Hamiltonian using this uh, uh, this part. So we will have we will have the following the following Hamiltonian. Which will now have only y, only x dependence. There's only x dependence. It's px squared over two m plus. Um, let's see. So we have e b x here and we can write it in the form of e square b square over 2m and then we have the our result of h bar k 
so the, this one will have a form of x all other parts minus h bar k over e b squared And, and the minus is from the sign of the electron charge. So if you look at this one, this is the, basically, this one is the Hamiltonian of the one-dimensional harmonic oscillator. One the harmonic oscillator. And you can just say that the wave functions are centered at some, uh, so this is our, this is our um, x component, so this is one dimension, so it's on the x component there. And you can say that this, um, the center of the wave function would be at this a x0, which are h bar, h bar k over e b. So the wave functions um, are centered wave functions are centered at x0 and this k is actually is ky for motion in y direction so those are plane waves as we discussed just a few minutes ago for motion in y direction sometimes in the literature you can find um, these uh, this term h bar over e b a square root actually of h bar over e b which is defined uh, as the magnetic lens you can check that the dimensionalities in the units of length and it's convention it's convenient um, a dimension of the problem so basically it kind of tells you what would be the um, what would be the size of the of the wave function? All right, so we have a Schrodinger equation. We know it's the it's the one-dimensional harmonic oscillator, and we know what would be the eigenenergies of this uh, of a simple harmonic oscillator. So eigen energies of a simple harmonic oscillator. They are quantized, and you have. The the nth eigen eigen eigenvalue is m plus one half h bar omega c, where I used for omega c is uh, e b over m, and this h this omega c is called uh, cyclotron frequency. So the states of different n are called Landau levels. So E n, those are Landau levels. And they are regularly spaced. So the, the separation between the Landau levels, so delta E n is uh, h bar omega c.